that's a lot of work. I can personally confirm that the bees are some of the hardest working little creatures out there in the garden, and without them, there wouldn't be a garden. As critical pollinators, bees are responsible for pollinating 70 of the 100 crops that the majority of the world's population depends on for food. But as important as they are, they are not the only beneficial bugs that you want to call your garden home. From how to attract the ones you want and keep away the ones you don't, we're going in depth with the good, the bad, and the buggy. We all know that there are certain bugs in our gardens that are a real menace, but you can get mother nature on your side and employ some of the beneficial insects that can help you win the war against some of those bad bugs. I'm Tim Kring, uh, professor, University of Arkansas Entomology Department. We're at the uh, University of Arkansas's Division of Agriculture Research Farm in Fayetteville. My specialty is entomology, which is the study of insects. A specific area of my work is with beneficial insects, so insects that eat insects. On this plant is a, uh, a common garden pest, aphids. Aphids are known as plant lice also, and if you're a gardener, you know about them. They occur on the bottom sides of leaves and up in the terminal, and sometimes even on your fruit. Most of the damage they cause is by direct feeding, where they reduce the vigor of that plant. They also transmit a lot of diseases to your plant. Aphids are controlled in a variety of ways without insecticides, often without you knowing it. Natural enemies, which is a name we use for beneficial insects, predators and parasites that attack these aphids and keep their, their numbers lower. One of the most common are uh, lady beetles. There's different kinds of lady beetles. The big red one we're most common with, but there's also little tiny black ones. All lady beetles have the same biology though. They start with eggs. Eggs are laid on the plant tissue. The common big red ones are a bright lemon yellow egg that are laid on end. They're kind of oblong in a group. And you, you'll commonly see those if you have aphids around. Then the, the eggs hatch into small larvae that look like small alligators. So for example, here we have a larval lady beetle that is up on top of this plant. And it's just like this one here. These lady beetle larvae are almost full grown and will soon become inactive and turn into what we call a pupa. And it's a resting stage where they become ready to become an adult. So here's a pupa of a lady beetle larva. You can see these in your home garden when you've had a lot of aphids, and these are a good thing, not a bad thing. So leave them alone, and fairly soon they will turn into an adult. Insects are diverse, and they range the whole gamut from very damaging to you and I, to also very beneficial to you and I. And the great majority of insects are really neither. They fall in that middle ground. But the insects also are a critical component in the whole ecosystem. Other animals live on insects. The plants need the insects. Pollinators come to mind. That it's a whole universe that they live in. Coming up, dealing with those pesky white flies. They're using that plant as not only as a home, but also as a local grocery store. And a little later, repelling bugs the natural stink freeway. Stay with us. You don't have to garden for very long to understand that white flies can be a real nuisance in your plants. But don't worry, we're here to help. Check this out. John, I feel like we're living in exciting times with regard to how we manage pests. So it, it is amazing how the awareness of gardeners and what they're applying and what little they have to apply. And are there other alternatives to control pests than simply getting out the old can of raid? Right, in the old days, that's what we do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We try very hard to reduce the amount of impact that we have on both on the plants but also on the environment. And we are using biologicals in the greenhouses now where we have, we're introducing a parasitic wasp that yes. actually lays its egg inside the white fly egg. Yes. And so it's basically feeding off of the egg and 
hence reducing the white fly population. So it feeds on that white fly embryo. Correct. Yeah. Then we also have another little spider, uh, a spider mite that actually eats, doesn't have to do anything injecting into the egg, it actually eats the egg and that's its breakfast. So it works out really well. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah. And by taking this approach, my assumption is you've been able to cut down a lot on the chemicals being used. We've dropped 70%, 70% so, of used. That's fantastic. Yeah. And that's not where we're gonna end. We're, we hope to totally eliminate pesticide application. Oh, that's, that's very heartening. You know, white flies are, are such an insidious little creature. And, and we found these plants out here that actually have a few little white flies on them. Right. Um, if someone picks up a, a container uh, with white flies, what's your recommendation of bringing it home? Well, usually you won't find it in the, in the garden center because there's lots of other plants in the garden center. It's usually when you're in the car. <laughs> or when you take the plants out of the car and yeah. now putting them in your That's home. That's when they become apparent. <laughs> yes. And so, you know, when you get the one or two flies that are coming up, it's, it's like, all right, that's a warning signal because they're using that plant as not only as a home, but also as a local grocery store. So the most important thing is isolate it from your other plants. It doesn't, it won't take long to find that culprit, mm -hmm. but isolate it from your other plants. Even if you do nothing other than biological control by squishing the eggs. Yes. You know. And the eggs are on the underside of the eggs leaf. Eggs are on the underside of the leaf. And nine chances out of ten, that's where the parents are gonna hide to. Sure, sure. I would never go to a garden center to shop wearing a yellow shirt or blouse. <laughs> because yellow is the primary attractant color for white fly. Well, I've noticed, and we've used this in my garden, um, but I've noticed even in some of your greenhouses. You've done really broad um, spans of what I would consider sticky tape, yellow sticky tape, yellow sticky to collect tape. them. That's a third way you're dealing with white fly specifically. Right, again, it's it's the indicator. You, you watch that tape, you know when you applied it, you know that if you walk past it every, every day, if there's a, one or two additional little bodies that are stuck to that tape, <laughs> you know that we either have to up the biologicals or uh, we need to find where that culprit plant is. Right, and, t and take some measure. Yes. Very good. John, thanks for all the great work you're doing to, to grow a greener plant. No. And a planet. And a planet. <laughs> Very great. good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ellen. Up next, ditch the chemicals and get rid of bugs nature's way. Don't miss it. Looking for a way to repel those nasty biting bugs without soaking yourself in some sort of insect spray? Why not make your own citronella candle? Bees are an integral part of most ecosystems. So next, we'll see what you can do to give them a boost.
Just take a look at this drift of Russian sage, one of my favorite plants because it's a perennial and so easy to grow, but it has an added benefit. It is a plant that I use to help support the pollinators here at the farm, specifically bees, honeybees, bumblebees, you name it, because they're so important to our food system. But bees have been on the decline lately, so I think we should all be looking at ways to bolster our pollinator population. To get some ideas on how to do this, Richard Underhill gives us the scoop. Bees are, are gentle creatures. The honeybee is our major pollinator. Uh, it is a stinging insect and it will sting to defend its nest, which is a beehive. Uh, when the bees are out visiting gardens, though they are not interested in uh, stinging people and they're very gentle. There are a few families of plants that are particularly attractive to the uh, bees and the native pollinators because they provide uh, f the food in the way of nectar and pollen. Uh, some of these families include the composite family, which is the sunflower family, the mustard family, the mint family, the legumes, and rose families also are very attractive to the um, bees. Pollinator gardens can be any kind of garden, but we try to be very prudent in our use of pesticides so that we don't kill the important uh, beneficial insects. We need to provide water uh, for the, uh, uh, all of the pollinators in our pollinator gardens. This can be a, a shallow bowl with some rocks in it to provide a place for the, for the insects to, to climb on. It can be a waterfall, anything that a person would like to have in their garden. Uh, by providing pollinator gardens, we are uh, assisting our bees and our native pollinators uh, in, in providing for our food. We're an, an inherent uh, integral part of our own food supply, as the bees are. After the break, we'll take a look at how the veggies in your landscape can affect your local insects. There's so many different ways to grow edibles or vegetables and herbs. You know, some gardeners, if they've got a lot of space, they love to create long rows where they segregate the different varieties and keep them separated. And that's one way to do it. And then others like to mix it up. You know, a little of this, a little of that, where they all intertwine. It's just another approach. Edibles are so versatile. Most will grow in a wide variety of conditions. The possibilities are frankly endless when you know what you're doing. You see with this resurgence of growing your own food, mixing edibles with ornamental flowers is more appealing, especially if you have limited space. Hey Angel, how you doing? You taking a break? You see just about anything you can grow in the garden, you can grow in containers, which makes it really handy just outside the kitchen door. Here I've created a theme garden, a tea garden, using aromatic herbs like lavender, a couple of types of mint. This is chocolate mint and sweet mint. Over here I have lemon balm and rosemary. You can create other types of themed gardens. And no matter what theme you choose, I always recommend that you use larger containers and always go for dwarf or patio varieties of vegetables when you can. They just work better in smaller spaces. There are also practical reasons for mixing edibles with more ornamental flowers in your garden. You see, it's all about diversity. Flowering plants attract pollinating and beneficial insects, so having them close to your edibles increases the chances of these little workers lending a hand. Another great place to think about using edibles in your landscape is along a path as a border, like I've done here with parsley. And if you're looking for a ground cover, why not think about using oregano or thyme? Now you just want to remember the conditions of your site. Most of these plants need six hours of sun each day. They require consistent moisture. And if you focus on herbs, one of the great things about them is many of them are drought tolerant. No matter what size garden you have, it's just more efficient to mix the herbs, vegetables, and flowers. And hey, not only do you get the beauty, but you get great tasting flavor. Mm-hmm, you're a good tasting basil. Want to learn more? 
Visit pallensmith.com for delicious recipes, garden tips, blog posts, and our online store. Look at all you little guys. Hey, the next time you're considering dealing with a pest problem in your garden, why not enlist some of the little guys? Look at these ladybugs. They're great for taking care of aphids and other insects. You know, whether it's increasing pollination, dealing with pests, or even improving your soil, some of these underestimated beneficial insects and microbes can do so much to improve your garden in a natural way. And frankly, it's just a lot of fun. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith. All right, go get them, guys. What a platoon of ladybugs.